gas was to open a whole new chapter of Victorian household catastrophes. What we had in the past was everybody would be congregated around a single lamp and it would be either oil or a candle or something else. And then all of a sudden, people didn't want to live on top of each other all the time. We wanted to find better ways of doing it. And it was towards the end of the, the Victorian era that they started bringing gas lighting. Lighting that was actually capable of lighting a whole room. It was a, a massive step forward. It was a, the greatest innovation. You could have a room that was completely lit. They had coal gas, they had um, something that was called wood gas, and they had um, another material called uh, water gas. Um, now, these were highly po poisonous. There was no control, there was no stopcock, it was just gas. The worst killer was because you couldn't actually smell it, so you'd have no idea until it was too late, basically. Uh, you would just keel over and that would be the, be the end of you. In the second half of the 19th century, the papers, everything from the Worcester Evening News to the Western Gazette, are full of stories of people dying horribly. These aren't headline cases, they're just little snippets that give the facts and figures. So, for example, in the Manchester Evening News in 1886, there's a story of five boys suffocating in a loft. Or there's this one from the Sheffield Independent, 1872, the lady was found confined in a bedroom with her infant and its nurse, and it says she must have unconsciously deranged the joint of the gas stove, thus permitting an escape of gas. All three were found apparently lifeless. But why were such cases so widespread? It may seem obvious to us now, but at the time the dangers of gas were not known to the man in the street. And the gas company's adverts didn't help matters. Some of the major gas companies coming out with misnomers that gas was actually good for people, that you could actually have a room full of gas and walk in there with a naked light and it would be perfectly safe. Gas companies were popping up all over the place. You, know, you couldn't walk a block in London without seeing a gas company. It, they were, the rivalry was just huge. But of course, with rivalry comes cost cutting. What you also had at the time was unscrupulous activities going on between gas suppliers, where they would actually sabotage their, um, their opponents or their competitors by actually dropping the pressure. To save money, companies would reduce their own gas supply to customers at night. The, the gas lamp would actually just flicker away and then blow out in the middle of the night. And then the gas would just seep into your home and you wouldn't be waking up in the morning. It was the heart of the industrial period. They wanted everything new, manufactured, to be the seen to be at the cutting edge of what was going on. Uh, and that was then how they drove innovation, through m making something, engineering something. If it wasn't engineered, it wasn't good. The speed of change was breathtaking, but there was neither the time nor the will to test these products that would be sold to millions of consumers. One of the most brilliant contraptions in this age of scientific progress was a system that could provide warmth throughout the whole house, a massive improvement on open coal fires and drafty chimneys. Gas central heating was a huge thing. In the 1800s, um, they came up with the idea of a, um, a sealed system where you could, you could heat water, exactly the same as a steam train, basically, in a huge cylinder. It was very volatile. The pressure inside these boilers was just absolutely phenomenal. They were running them all around houses. You could have 10, 12, 15, 16 radiators on each system. But of course, you could be sitting down having your, having your lunch and the steam valve doesn't open. You could be tucking into your turtle soup and the next thing is a huge explosion and you'll be leaving the building without opening the door. The pressure was just huge, so it was only ever going to end up in, in one story, really. It was going to be an accident and people will die. The main problem was that they didn't understand the dangers of what they were doing. Gas and cast iron hadn't been used in this way in the home before. When they were actually doing the casting, it was at the very forefront of that technology 
of understanding that, that, that weaknesses and flaws in that, car, in that casting could actually cause problems further down the line. The inventive Victorian engineer, having tackled heat and light, now turned his attention to cooking stoves. What could be so dangerous about a stove like this? With an open system, when you had the coal and the, the massive flue with the smoke pouring up the chimney, it, ventilation was superb because the air would run through the kitchen, straight up the chimney, take all the smoke away. But when they sort of encompassed it into a sealed container, they had problems with pressure uh, and they, they had problems with getting rid of the smoke because the, the, the actual ventilation and the draft, there wasn't one to go through the system to take the smoke away. So inevitably, the kitchens become really smoky. And of course, this could lead to anything uh, up to suffocation. If you avoided suffocating in the smoky kitchen, you still had a potential problem. They made sealed units and poured hot water into them and used them sort of the, like the modern day kettle. And of course, this was a, a, boil, as a boiling pot. And of course, they had no uh, release valves or anything like that. And of course, these stoves were just exploding. It was like a small time bomb. It was a totally sealed unit. They didn't understand um, the pressures and what happened when you introduced oxygen. And you had these huge, huge catastrophic explosions in kitchens. Towards the end of the Victorian era, a new power source gradually came into play. They were starting to turn away from gas because it was so volatile and go towards electricity, basically. But electricity was a a killer as well. It wasn't 100% safe when they were, you know, first coming up with these ideas of light bulbs and because you mix electricity with gas, so you, you know you bring your electric lights in. We've still got your gas cooker, and these gas cookers were left on. You know the joint still corroded, broke down, and let gas escape. And of course, you'd come down in the morning and turn your wonderful new electric light on, and that's the first thing that explodes is is your gas cooker. So the two of them that they weren't to go together. It's, it, it was a recipe for disaster again. It wasn't until 1923 that any safety regulations were brought in. But the benefits of a warm, cosy home meant that most were willing to risk the consequences. Invention was running 100 miles an hour and we just weren't quick enough to keep up with all the fitters or we weren't skilled enough to keep up with it. But the amount of deaths that happen through negligence, not just through not understanding the, the, about the material you're using, was huge. But if that's your blooming game, I intend to do the same. For the little of what you fancy does it good. Like the Victorians before them, the new Edwardian middle classes had the spare cash to purchase products that would make their home lives more comfortable. The most exciting new invention on the market was electricity. It would not only transform every room of the Edwardian house, but it would make possible a whole host of new domestic inventions and gadgets. If there's one thing we take for granted, it's that this works. But imagine how incredible it must have been when it was introduced. This clean, invisible, magical energy that transformed the Edwardian evening into day. So what problems could there possibly be? Electricity in our modern homes is subject to all kinds of regulations, but the unsuspecting Edwardian had no idea what damage it could do. When it was first invented, it was considered to be quite magical. It was clean, of course, and it was, uh, they thought, I guess they thought it was safe, and it uh, meant they could do things that they couldn't do before. They could put on a light at the turn of a switch. It completely transformed the amenities within the ordinary domestic house. It was in the late 19th century that the components needed for electrification began to be developed. The vital invention was made by both Joseph Swan in Britain and Thomas Edison in America the incandescent light bulb. 
Street lights came first, and then in the Edwardian period, individual companies began to produce electricity to offer to domestic households. Gas lighting and heating had become popular in Victorian times, but it was a dirty source. As well as being potentially explosive, it left a residue of grime. Electric light seemed to offer the perfect alternative. It might seem an obvious thing that electricity should replace gas, but at the time, um, electricity companies and gas companies were very much in competition. People had just got used to gas lighting and now they're faced with a new technology, something else, which they've been told to sort of take on and adopt in their lives. This is um, instructions about how you'd use your Edison electric light. And it says, do not attempt to light with match, simply turn key on wall by the door. Um, sounds quite bonkers to us today that you have to explain it in that way. We know how we operate our electricity, we know we go to the light switch, but then that wasn't so obvious. At the turn of the century, electricity was far more expensive than gas, but it was heavily marketed by the supply companies who could see the possibilities and the profits. We get key figures like Lord and Lady Randolph Churchill choose to have it in their homes, and this is sort of widely reported in the press, so it becomes um, more attractive and almost glamorous for some of the middle classes to take it on. The newspapers were full of the wonders of electricity. For example, the Dundee Courier in December 1906 praised its romantic story and said that its rapid advance is more wonderful than any tale of wild Arabian fiction. It seemed chic, modern and desirable. If you were a sophisticated, urban, up-to-date family, you needed electricity in your house, you needed electric lamps, and those who didn't have it simply seen as behind the times. So if you really wanted to show off to your business associates that you were the right type of person, you brought in the electric light. And so gradually, Edwardian homes began to be lit by electricity. But it was a completely new, little understood force. And electricity cables were just that, naked, bare cables. One touch and you could be electrocuted. Early cases, the, elect the, the cables weren't actually insulated at all. They used to you just run through wooden runners, um, and then they'd just be bare running around the properties. When they did catch on to insulation, they used the wrong material. Originally, they were made just lined in paper and lead. A fantastic fire accelerant. Brilliant. They even tried wrapping it in cloth, they, they wrapped it up in wood, they wrapped it up in net. Basically anything they thought might stop the electricity getting through and somebody inadvertently touching it. And earthing, the ability to make a 40 circuit safe by redirecting it to the earth, simply didn't exist. There's no earth, there was nothing at all. So if you had a small child that could just, you know, run around and, and touch one of these things, they're absolutely... Lethal. Lethal or not, the fearless Edwardians kept inventing and found the new power source could be used for all sorts of domestic appliances. Its full potential could be seen in the electric house, the centrepiece of the 1908 Manchester Electrical Exhibition, the tomorrow's world of its day. And on display were all the must-have items for the ideal Edwardian home. One excited visitor wrote a postcard about their visit. I went to the electrical exhibition last week and spent a very enjoyable afternoon. Kettles boiling and frying pans on the go, all on a clean table without a speck of dust. What sort of items were available? A whole range of things that we see now and we find a commonplace in our homes today, but also a whole other range of things which maybe we're not so familiar with. All sorts of weird and wonderful appliances appeared some of which had not been seen before or since, as suppliers tried to generate a demand for electricity beyond the electric light. What's this? That's actually an early electric curling tong, and you just put your curling tong in there to heat up. And this must have been quite a breakthrough, to have an electric iron for the first time. Up until now, irons had been heated on coal stoves. In many ways, I guess that is quite a breakthrough and one of the appliances that people probably were most fond of in the early days. 
A look at the magazines and papers of the time reveals a fundamental lack of understanding about how to use electricity safely, even by some manufacturers. In the Evening Telegraph of December 1908, it recommended the use of an electric tablecloth, a device which it says up-to-date hostesses will not be long in taking advantage of. One of the most unusual items is probably this one here. This is a tablecloth, it's an illuminating tablecloth, and the idea is that you turn it the other way round, so you'd have this side showing. Mm -hmm. And wired up inside here are just bare wire connectors. <laughs> you'd lay it down, you'd cover it with your cloth, basically plug your lamp on the base. Into, into the, the tablecloth? Directly into the tablecloth. You're pronging through and making that connection. I can see that's quite fun, but presumably it's also really dangerous. I mean, if you yeah, spill yes, something... Yes, yes, extremely dangerous. Whoever in their right mind thought up of putting a tablecloth which stores water and food and all the rest of it and run electricity through it was beyond me. But it was, it was new. It was, it was, that's what you need to do. And it was sold and marketed as being the new technology, lamps that are on the table. Thankfully, despite the marketing, this electrical wonder did not catch on. They had the goods, but they didn't have the infrastructure we have today. And here lay the problem. They would use the light socket to run all sorts of pieces of equipment, possibly even electric heaters. Now, from, the, from the wires going to the light? That's right, yes. They would put an adapter into the light socket. They would then run a bulb plus another piece of equipment off that. And in extreme cases, they would add a number of adapters and have a number of different sorts of pieces of equipment coming off the light, light circuit. And then you would get this whole sort of cascade of adapters coming out from the ceiling fitting, what we call a Christmas tree, leading to lots of different pieces of equipment. So, for example, people would be doing ironing off the lighting circuit, and they would maybe have an electric heater running off the lighting circuit. And, of course, every extra piece of equipment was adding an additional uh, energy load to the system, which is why we would get uh, overheating of the system and potential fires. Because whenever they plugged um, lights in or toasters or refrigerators, they used to overheat and the current that would be running through the cable would start melting the cable, and then this cable would catch fire. To demonstrate how quickly overloading can cause a fire, Martin applies a battery to wire wall. The battery is too high a voltage for the wire, mirroring what might have happened in the Edwardian home when extra appliances were added to the electric light socket. This overloading of one circuit is what caused fires in Edwardian homes. It wasn't safety regulated in the way ours is now. There were no um, consumer units, miniature circuit breakers, or, or any of that safety equipment that we now rely on. Modern fuse boxes protect homes from this. As soon as the system becomes overloaded, it cuts out. But back then, the electricity would keep flowing. There'd be a fire in the house, and knowing you're lucky, you'll be in bed when it happens, and there'd be no getting out. Although the Institution of Electrical Engineers issued its first wiring regulations in 1882, they were often ignored. Part of the problem was that initially, electricity was sold by individual local companies who each supplied a particular voltage of electricity to their local area. So an iron used at home in Manchester wouldn't be compatible with one in Liverpool. It was down to the individual generating company, what voltage and what ampage that they, they put the electricity into the properties. So even though you understood one system, it didn't mean that if you went further down the road or bought the electricity from somebody else, it would be exactly the same. On its own, le and left alone, electricity isn't only dangerous. It's when you bring in the human factor, that's when electricity becomes dangerous. <laughs> There were countless stories in the newspapers of the many and varied ways people had managed unwittingly to electrocute themselves. He accidentally touched the main and, receiving the full force of the current, was killed on the spot. 
The deceased, while larking, swung himself upon an electric light bracket, which broke, and the electric current passed through his body. Being electrocuted, the effects of that depend on several things. The current, the duration of the electric shock that you have, and also the voltage. If you have a very low current uh, electric shock for a sufficient duration, it can affect the beating of the heart. If you disturb that electrical flow around the heart, each of the individual heart muscles can uh, contract individually, and so there's no concerted effort, and so no blood will be pump pumped around the body. So damaging the heart with an electric shock is particularly dangerous, and that can happen even at quite a low current. If you have a very high current, you typically get a burn where the electricity enters and possibly leaves the body, and that may cause instant death as it causes the heart to stop. Though slow to address the dangers of electricity, Edwardians credited it with all kinds of health-giving properties, which led to some strange practices. What is that? It's got a sort of space-age element to it, hasn't it? Does, it? Doesn't it's it? well used. Um, it's an early sunray lamp. It was meant to encourage sort of good health. The theory was that this would um, make you healthier, and there are adverts from a bit later on where they show babies positioned in front of these. The therapeutic use of electricity also extended into the medical profession, where it was applied to a range of physical and mental illnesses. Have you got any other surprising items? Yes, there are some surprising items. This is a fairly early um, um, massage machine, electric massage machine. It's a bit like a ray gun, I think, that one. It does look a bit like a ray gun, or a sort of a microphone. You, <laughs> you think Elvis. <laughs> and this is for massage? Um, ostensibly for massage. It was often used for more intimate sort of purposes as well, but it was sold as a, oh, an electric that's what massage this is. machine. Right, <laughs> OK. <laughs> Some of the things Edwardians got up to in their own homes revealed how little they understood this deadly force. To my amazement, I even found an extraordinary headline in the Daily Mail. A man accidentally electrocuted himself during his daily beautifying routine. He was using an electrical gadget which was plugged in at the mains and was designed to enhance and inflate his pecs. A man's fatal vanity. He attached a needle wire to the electric light, worked the needle over his breast, and dropped dead. Eventually, the Edwardians were given the option of a wall socket instead of the light, but this brought up another issue. At the time, both the plug and the socket contained metal, which created a small spark when they came into contact. The spark is typical of any piece of equipment which is, is being, uh, being plugged in or plugged out when the equipment is live. So as two pieces of metal um, come into contact or come out of contact when they are live, then a spark will occur. As most Edwardian homes were still using a lot of gas, which was prone to leaking, this small spark could be enough to cause a big explosion. Explosion just waiting to happen from the tiniest amount of gas and your windows and doors and you would be on the street waiting for the, for the undertaker, I would imagine. Over time, improvements were applied that lessened the dangers. It wasn't until 1908, 1909, that Edison came up with the idea of a rubber socket which went onto a plug which had a fuse in which obviously saved any shocks when you were touching it. It saved any, any problems with insulating, and it saved this problem of overheating. But with its varying currents, assortment of sockets and plugs, no earth or fuse box, Edwardian electricity was a dangerous business, especially as it was often installed and maintained by DIY enthusiasts. 
anyone could really wire up their home. So potentially you've got people not knowing what they're doing getting into big trouble. Even one of Edison's um, friends killed himself, he electrocuted himself, and that's somebody who knew, who knew what he was doing. By 1915, there were 600 separate electricity suppliers across the country. The demands of war led the government to take steps to set up electricity commissions to make the generation and supply of electricity more efficient. And then the, the government actually made a, a declaration that we would all use the same current uh, voltage, it would all come through the same way, and it was the start of the, the grid. Despite all its early dangers, electricity became the utility of choice for the modern Edwardian. Children now had rooms of their own and all sorts of newfangled toys that were designed to be educational and to prepare them for their future careers. So the girls had electric irons and ovens, and the boys had model aircraft and train sets and chemistry sets. Although the odd girl did creep in. Look, there's me. Yeah, I'd, I'd had the chemistry set as a, a it, was, it came as a Christmas present. And it was, it, was, it was only literally an hour before I'd uh, blown it up. 17-year-old Ian Findlay was experimenting with his chemistry set in the living room of his home. There was an explosion. Neighbours heard the bang and ran out to find that the living room window had been blown out. Ian managed to make his way to number 72, where Mrs K.C. Bell treated an injured arm, put him to bed, and summoned an ambulance. Chemistry sets throughout the years have reflected many changes in science and society, and never more so than after the Second World War. Young, would-be chemists, inspired by the apocalyptic images in the comics of the day and their soldier fathers, could not resist experimenting with terrifying consequences. Two 14-year-old pupils were seriously injured on Saturday when an explosion occurred while they were trying to make liquid oxygen. Well, this is the chemistry set. Oh, my goodness. I took go my vintage up. chemistry set to Joy Ledger at the Bristol Science Centre to find out just how dangerous this box really was. So, what's most alarming about it, I suppose? Copper sulphur would definitely have a hazard warning today. The test tubes are so flimsy. They really are. We wouldn't use anything like this in a lab at school these days. These, heated with a Bunsen burner, wouldn't last very long. They'd melt very quickly. Bunsen burner? Yes. Gosh, it's tiny. And this would go where? Well, Into the... Presumably. Gas supply. The gas supply. Which is unbelievable that they could actually have, and there must be some sort of tap to turn the gas on and off. So you've got the full force of the gas coming in that would feed the whole cooker, just going through that little flame. Oh, my goodness. We decide to read the instruction booklet. Always a good idea. Only... There's absolutely no diagrams at all. And actually, I think it says up here um, that you will see there are no diagrams, so then you can be more liberal with your experiment. You can change the apparatus as you, as you feel. I, I'm just staggered at the... Um, the lack of instructions, um, the idea of quantities, concentrations, there's no indication of how much um, solution to add to each one, no a mention of how to dispose of the chemicals at the end. It's, it's just frightening, and there's absolutely no mention of parental supervision. Still, at least they are clear about what to do if your chemistry kit-loving chum has a problem. It actually says here that if the clothing of the person is on fire, pull the person down to the floor, or strike them sharply behind the knees so they fall. <laughs> Cover them with any materials you might have to hand, with rugs, cloths or carpet, etc. And then it says, you will have used your scientific knowledge in the noblest way. You will have applied science to the service of man, with capital letters, and probably saved life. And it says underneath, science is never evil except in wrongly used by man. Many of the chemicals in chemistry sets were caustic, so they would burn the skin and irritate it, which, of course, would be particularly dangerous if it got into the eyes. 
part of the point of the chemistry sets was that they exploded. They wanted to make these explosions and the bright colours to impress friends and make it look like a magic trick. The explosions could burn, set the hair on fire, set the clothes on fire, damage the eyes, even blind a child. And of course, children wanted to share these with their friends and they'd think nothing of putting some of the chemicals in their pockets when they went out. And of course, that could burn holes in the material and, and then in the skin, or even catch fire spontaneously. With some chemicals, 14-year-old Ian Marori meant to stage some experiments with his home chemistry set. But he put them in his pocket while he went to the pictures with his mother. He was sitting watching the show when his clothes began to smolder. A man sitting nearby wrapped his coat round the boy to smother the burning clothing. The accident was due to body heat igniting the chemicals in his pocket. Today, health and safety regulations are more stringent than they were in 1950s cinemas. So we are wearing goggles to do an experiment to illustrate how lethal this kit could be. Right, now in here we have the permanganate, which is the chemical we saw in the, the purple chem chemical that was in the kit. Neris Shah, our lab technician, is going to add glycerol, a clear, odourless liquid that might have been found in the home medicine cabinet as it was used to treat constipation and sore throats. OK. So what we're going to do is just make a little pile of the potassium permanganate in the middle. And then I'm just going to pour in a couple of drops of the glycerol on top. So it sort of looks like nothing's happening. Ah, there we go. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. It's not necessarily child's play. So it makes quite a lot of smoke and some beautiful purple flames. And quite a smell. <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah, a little bit of a smell. Oh, my word. And, and, what's just... the, and that hesitation, that moment of it looking like nothing's going to happen is the most yeah. dangerous thing of all, isn't it? Well, if I was a child, I'd have moved on to something else by then. Neris only used a small amount of potassium permanganate and a drop of glycerol. Imagine if we'd been more liberal in the amounts we used. A warning was sounded at an Epsom inquest today that there are grave dangers in letting children play with chemicals which are in themselves harmless, but in combination may be fatal. John Jesty, aged 15, died in hospital from injuries received in an explosion which also injured a boy companion. Unsurprisingly, the American chemistry kits were even more spectacular. There was even an American chemistry set that included uranium dust and a mini Geiger counter so that children could do experiments and measure the radiation. The company didn't stop making it because of the dangers of the dust. It just didn't sell very well. Uranium actually wasn't very exciting. It didn't explode and have puffs of smoke, and nobody wanted to buy it. Eventually, new laws came in which required the kits to be non-explosive and non-toxic. But it's worth remembering what the chemistry set manufacturers used to say. Experimenter today, scientist tomorrow. But I think the really interesting thing about chemistry sets, if you interview eminent scientists nowadays, many of them will actually say that it was having a chemistry set as a child that sparked their interest in the science. 